Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black. Welcome into the broadcast podcast, The Rob Black Show. Tell friends about it, please. Uh, maybe even post it on your socials. That would be nice. <clears throat> Goal is to get people to retirement. Um, yesterday, the Nasdaq was lower. The SP was lower. The Dow was lower. We're starting the new year off. Not great. But we had a whole year performance in October, November, and December of 2023. And we had a great year from January to October in 2023. So we got two years of performance. Maybe not that much, but that's the right idea. Um, so we're going to start off with what happened last year late. Fund managers, stockbrokers, they're like, oh, poop. If I didn't own any of the Magnificent Seven, I'm going to look like an idiot when I send my bill out. So they bought Apple, and they bought Amazon, and they bought Meta, and they bought Tesla, um, Alphabet. They bought them all, NVIDIA, all at the last second, all in the last three months of the year to make it look like when they showed their top holdings, they were right. So I think what's happening right now is they're decoupling from those. Does it make those Magnificent Seven bad or anything like that? It just creates a situation where they want to look for value because value should work better this year. The year that the Magnificent Seven had last year means they probably won't have it this year. Small cap, mid cap, international are the broad categories that should work better this year. In our falling interest rate environment. Doesn't mean the Magnificent Seven won't have a positive year. Just means that that's the way it should play out. A broadening of the breadth of the market. Tech stocks dropped the market down yesterday with Magnificent Seven suffering their fourth day down trading day in a row. Investors digested the Fed's newly released meeting notes showing the timeline for 2024 20, interest rate cuts is murky. It's not June, it's not April. The stock market tends to think that it's April uh, to try to get some of the done move done before the election period. Technically, they don't want to, or in theory, they don't want to look like they're influencing the market by juicing the economy. AMC fell to an all-time low, failing to keep that meme stock magic going. I throw that out there because I know an idiot who owns AMC. He owns too much of it, and his thought is it's a small number. And if it turns into a mid-sized number, it's going to be a winner-winner chicken dinner for his portfolio. That's kind of a sick, bizarre way of thinking about it. I'd rather buy great companies than buy numbers. There was no Santa Claus rally this year. There was a Santa Claus rally, though, that did occur in October. It simply veered off course. It came early. Santa took the stock market rally for some R&R. The stock market calls the Santa Claus rally the last five days of trading in 2023 and the first two in 2024. The S&P 500 declined nine-tenths of a percent in the past seven trading sessions with almost all that decline coming yesterday. Not when it rallied as much as it did 16.8% from the low on October 27th through the end of the year. But you can't get caught up in Santa Claus rallies. I say buy great companies. I say diversify. I say use tax strategies. Um, I made a lot of my I made a lot of income last year with using my core positions as a way of generating income off of with options through a professional firm that EP Wealth has put in place for financial planning. I made more money in income last year from options than I did from salary. You always have to be working whatever lever you can pull to get to your goal of retirement. Um, So there's a little mixed disposition out there today. American Express is up after being upgraded by JP Morgan to overweight from neutral. That one should work. American Express kind of represents a lot of smaller companies in the United States and small businesses. And the idea is small should do well this year. Not after the first rate cut, but at the third rate cut, people will really start speculating, this is really going to help the economy. 
Eli Lilly is up today after announcing Lilly Direct, whereby patients can obtain obesity, migraine, and diabetes medications direct from Eli Lilly. That's pretty amazing. So there's a website where you can discreetly go and get a prescription. That's something that I learned that I wasn't really conscious of during COVID and lockdown. Federal regulations made it a lot easier for you to get medications prescribed online. I kind of knew that with telehealth, but I recently talked to a friend who um, is getting, what's the one for, um, I'm dropping the name of it. It's not Rogaine. It's the one for oh, Propecia. He's getting Propecia online for his balding. And I was like, you didn't go to the doctor for that? Cause like I'm getting older for sure. And, uh, and he says, yeah, you just jump on a website um, and they send the stuff to you from a uh, pharmacy online. And there's like 10 of them, he said. So it's not like it's, you know, a, a Canadian pharmacy. It's not like a Mexican pharmacy. So Eli Lilly's doing the same thing. And I think that's genius. Because a lot of people don't like going to doctors and a lot of people don't like that process. Now, I haven't checked the pricing of what obesity, migraine and diabetes uh, medications are going to cost. But I think that online is going to help. Walgreens is down today after topping fiscal expectations. They slashed their dividend by 48%. Ouch. Um, the Fed meeting um, from December, they released the notes from it yesterday. The minutes noted that it seemed likely that a lower target range for the Fed funds rate would be appropriate by the end of 2024. But when they start and how they get there, they didn't say. There were acknowledgments that the future data could make for the rate hikes appropriate and that the target range for the Fed funds rate could be held where it is longer than anticipated. So if you were to boil some of that information down, rates are going to stay higher longer, and we don't know when they're going to start. We can't really guess when they're going to start cutting rates. Or are they playing a little bit of poker and trying not to get the market ahead of itself? That's Generally speaking, a lot of people are expecting spring, early summer. I don't think that's too far from where we are today. That should be a catalyst for the market. Maybe in the second quarter of the year, maybe the first quarter we go nowhere. And that's okay. Um, because I think the bull market really kind of started in October, November, December. Oh, no, it started all of 2023 when you kind of got the feeling the Fed was done and the Magnificent Seven were doing so great. The last three quarter, the last three months of 2023, there was speculation the Fed was going to cut interest rates. When the reality is that they start, that'll keep the leg moving in a bull market. We have a ways. I, no, 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 no. We don't have a ways to go on this. Um, bull market should go higher in the next 12 to, over the next 12 to 18 months. But things can happen too. Wars can happen. Oil prices can spike. A lot can happen. So you never ever count on it like. It's your lunch money. You count on it like um, it works over time. Um, yields are climbing today. That's worthy of note. ADP estimated that 164,000 jobs were added to private sector payrolls in December, following a downward revised 101,000 in November. Initial jobs came to the week ending December 30th, decreased by 18,000 to 202,000. The labor market is still in really good shape. That helps the bull market theory or the mid to longer term. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial, money, investing, more. Find me online at robblackshow.com. Join Rob Black in Sunnyvale, Saturday, January 20th, for Pints and Portfolios, a less formal event at a local watering hole for those close to retirement with 500000 or more in investable assets. Drop by January 20th from 11.30 a.m. till 2 for a little sunshine and a complimentary portfolio review or financial snapshot from Ryan Ignacio, CFP from EP Wealth Advisors. Whether you're on the road to retirement or already there, this financial snapshot can provide you with a second opinion analysis of where you are and highlight areas for improvement and opportunities for growth. Go to robblackshow.com and click the events tab. Find pints and portfolios and click to register. You'll answer a few simple questions about your situation, and your confirmation email will provide all the details on the event and how to schedule your portfolio review. Space is limited, and registration is required, so go to robblackshow.com today. That's robblackshow.com. Got my first sign up for Pints and Portfolios. Um, Space is limited. It's coming Saturday, January 20th in Sunnyvale, 1130 to 2. It's the first event of the year. 
I want to do two or three of these a year. It gets me out in the community. It gets me face to face with you in a non pressure scenario where I'll buy you a beer or you could buy me a beer. And we talk stocks and portfolios. We talk, are you ready for retirement? Um, if you have $500,000 in investable assets, i.e. if you're a church, um, I will offer you a CFP to not on the spot because that would be weird to involve alcohol and professional advice. Uh, but they'll evaluate your portfolio based on tax efficiency, diversification, returns, and risk. And they'll give you kind of a grade where you are. Free. This is a valuable community service. Do check it out. I think you're going to like it. Um, there's only 10 total spots. Typically, we get about 10 and 5 people fail. That's just the way people are. Uh, but they're really good events. They were my favorite things that I did last year. Uh, Saturday, January 20th, 1130 to 2, Sunnyvale, California. Sign up today because it's coming up fast. But if not enough people sign up, then it's even more fun because it's just kind of a one-on-one -on -one with a normal human being and myself. Um, anyway, let's move on to market data. This one's really, really important in my opinion. T. Rowe Price came out with um, kind of a data sheet that tells you how much income you need and how much savings you're going to need based on your retirement during the uh, for your retirement years. What do I mean by that? Let's put this another way. How much do you have to have saved for retirement based on your current income? It's kind of an art. It's not a science, but I like where they're going at with this. Retirement's a huge milestone for us all. Planning for retirement can constitute a large financial goal that takes years and years and years to reach. When I look back, what I started at at 18 versus where I'm at now in my 50s, I'm pretty pleased. I didn't think I could get that high of a number. Stoked about it, though. Majority of Americans have only have $65,000 saved for retirement. It's far less than most experts want you to have. The average American, the majority of Americans, that's even worse than the average. The majority of Americans only have $65,000 saved. That's a car. That's, uh, well, it's more than a roof. Maybe that's a roof and uh, a driveway. I don't know. I don't know price driveways very often. But T. Rowe Price released an updated guide for retirement savers based on income levels. And this should work for you. Uh, planning for retirement can be intimidating. So they give it in a really, really simple chart. If you want a copy of this, I'll send it to you. It's just, uh, where was it published? Um, it looks like a Reuters story. That's interesting. Uh, but T. Rowe Price, planning for retirement... Um, they're giving you, they're saying it, they're including compounding interest for you, even though it's not shown. Most people looking to retire around age 65 should aim to save between 13 and a half times their pre-retirement income gross. That's their bottom line. However, the rage widens significantly as savers approach retirement. At age 30, you should have half your income. At age 35, all of your income. So if you're making $100,000 at age 30, you should have 50,000 saved. At age 35, you should have 100,000 saved. At age 40, you should have 200,000 saved or two times. At age 45, they're saying three times. So if, if you're age 45 and you're earning about 100,000 a year, 300,000. This is pretty easy to follow. I like it a lot. And it's not so far from the truth. At age 50, you need five times. At age 55, you need seven times. By the age of 60, you need nine times. By the age of 65, 11 times. Wow. I want you to get to 20 times. You know why? Because you're going to mess up somewhere in there. Someone, somewhere, they're going to like get in a car accident. They're going to lose their teeth. They're going to find out teeth are expensive to replace. They're going to get in a car accident and find out that Teslas don't have good insurance. And that they just lost a major cash out of a, a vehicle. They get totaled really fast. The insurance on a Tesla is outrageous. About four times what the insurance on a normal car is. But I recommend saving more at a younger age and catching up less as savers age. Sounds appropriate, right? The more you save by the age 30, the better. At age 30... Fidelity says earners should have one times their salary. 
two times their salary by age 35. Like just went over that four times their salary by 45. Now, T. Rowe Price and Fidelity both have kind of the same business model. They want to get your assets. They want you to continue to contribute to them. So you take it down with a grain of salt, but you're like, are you really giving good advice that you want 13 and a half times your income? Look, it's not going to hurt you to get to 13 and a half times your income. T. Rowe Price assumes that early on in your career, younger earners tend to save 6% of their paychecks for retirement ramping up 1% per year until they reach 15%. Fidelity assumes you'll save 15% right from the start. I save everything that I can. If my 401k allows me to save 15% of my salary, I do. I hit the maximums every year. If I get an extra savings for being over 50 allowed, I do it. But also I use like all my credit card points, which range from 2 to 4%. If I can put those into cash or into my daily bills, like for instance, my Verizon credit card, it allows me to get 4% back on purchases from Verizon. Hey, look, my family for four, I, I use it, right? So I don't have a cell phone bill at all. And that money goes into more savings. Um, I've always been really good about using apps like Acorns. Um, Acorns is a great app. It takes your credit card spend. So if I spent $15 on 25 cents on lunch yesterday, it'll take that 25 cents, round it up to 75 cents and invest it for me. Automatically, I'm not going to tell them the difference between 15 and a quarter and $16 on lunch. I love that. I've saved over $100,000 in about five years Based on that alone, maybe four years, I don't have the exact number there. <clears throat> but that simple roundup has allowed me to, to benefit from market performance. Anyway, the goal is, again, 13 and a half times to 20 times your income by the time you retire. I don't think that's bad. You need a copy of this? Drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com or rob at robblack.com, and I'll send you it out. You can find me online at robblackshow.com. Questions about Social Security? Check out the Social Security Retirement Guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. I know this may be not exactly what you want, but let's review again a little bit about 2023. I like doing this at the start of the year a lot in large part because you learn, I didn't see that coming. And what I'm expecting for the next 12 months Loosely, is the Fed to cut interest rates three to six times. Maybe what I can expect the next 18 months is the Fed to cut three to six times. Mortgage rates will come down. Credit card rates will come down. Borrowing costs will come down. Servicing of debt costs will come down, and that should juice the economy. After that, you get into, well, I know there's going to be an election, but you don't know who's going to win. So let's take a look back at the year of 2023. China's COVID reopening was a relative bust. Okay, didn't see that one. Like we were opening in the United States and we we're flying and we we're traveling and we had a year of going into the uh, domestic travel in 2022. 2023 was a lot of let's go to Europe and let's uh, roll our pictures on Instagram. So we didn't really see China's COVID reopening being a relative bust. And the US China relationships are so very, very cold. It started with the Trump administration, it's carried over in the Biden administration. If we can warm those up, we got a little bit of juice for 2024. And I'm talking about gin and juice, sipping on gin and juice. I oh, watched the most hilarious um, Snoop Dogg video yesterday. And I know you're saying, please don't do this. I'll only do it once a year. But um, he was narrating an animal planet where this one lizard was trying to get away from snakes. And it was just funny because he's like, oh, we better jump. Ooh, ooh, they're coming for you. Um, it just made me smile on a day of not stress, but market anxiety, you know? Okay, so other things that happened in 2023, banking crisis. Wow. I once interviewed for a media position at Silicon Valley Bank. They're gone. They had a run on the money because venture capital money dried up. They are part of the people who lend to venture capitalists. They are part of the people who give banking services to venture capitalists. The low cost of money became a high cost of money in 2023. In 20, late 2022, with the Fed raising aggressively, 
um, venture capitalists and startups didn't have access to cash and they, they quickly tightened. And when push came to shove, rumors online that there was going to be a run of the bank perpetuated with posts on X and other social media sites. People pulled their money out. The bank collapsed. There's covenants that banks have to have X amount of cash on hand. They didn't have enough because it takes five clicks to close a bank account. I knew venture capitalists were having a tough time getting money. I didn't see that ripple effect. So I'm over two on could I have predicted this. Kevin McCarthy was ousted as Speaker of the House by his own party's doing. Didn't really see that one coming. But um, what that led to was a lot of political dysfunction. Not a lot got done last year in Congress. Federal Reserve raised rates four times in 2023, contributing to a collective 525 basis point rate increase since March of 2022. Real GDP was up an astounding 4.9% in the third quarter. So even though the Fed made money tighter, it really had very little effect on spending. Now, a lot of that is because we got government money during the COVID shutdown and our bank accounts were fatter. But a lot of it's because we kept employed. If you were to tell me the Fed would raise 525 basis points and the economy at the end of that height cycle, that we would have GDP at 4.9%, I would have said, no way. If you had said, bet a dollar and I'll give you a $1,000 return, I'd say that's a waste of a dollar. We all woke up on October 7th to Israel going to war with Hamas following uh, October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas on Israeli citizens. Pretty horrific to see human beings in their home attacked. Um, and the response has been pretty horrific. Um, there's a food crisis. There's a humanitarian issue that's problematic. And what's even more problematic, there's a lot of oil under the lands there. And there's a lot of shipping canals. Well, not a lot, but there's the Red Sea. Um, and that, that brings fear into people of, are we looking at another disruption of the supply chain? Or higher oil prices creating inflation, making the Fed go, you know what? We're not going to cut interest rates. And then there's, again, like I said, the humanitarian side of it. The 30-year fixed mortgage hit 8% in October of 2023. Ouch. And yet, in October of 2023, we saw like the housing market still continued to do well. The negatives of the housing market only lasted about 6 to 12 months, depending on what size of house you're in and what, what locality. And it wasn't much. Cash buyers helped keep things afloat as mortgages became a problem on affordability. And mortgage rates have dropped a good 125 basis points since 8%. So they're six, six and a half, six and a half percent in that ballpark now. But if we get three to six Fed rate cuts, we could be talking about five and a half percent mortgages again, which is pretty opportunistic. I would I I would like that. Bitcoin was a winner to the tune of 174% in 2023. All the only thing I could figure out was a spot Bitcoin ETF play. People are thinking it's coming. Maybe this week. We've been saying that for quite a few months now. Uh, just like recently seen a rally in marijuana stocks because people are thinking that the federal government with Biden is going to say, we're going to turn this from a, uh, a felony to much more of a misdemeanor to not really all that punishable at all, depending on how much you have and things like that. And that, that legislation is still not really in place yet. But there's... Talk about it a lot like there's talk about a potential spot Bitcoin ETF. A spot Bitcoin ETF would allow me to own Bitcoin exposure without actually owning Bitcoin. And I like that idea much more than actually owning Bitcoin and storing Bitcoin. Like I could own gold by investing in the ticker symbol GLD. And if gold goes up or down, I get that reaction. But I don't actually have to have a gold bar in my house. What's up with that senator who has gold bars in his house? That's crazy. If I were to, if you were to give me a dollar bet on does he get kicked out of the Senate, I'd say, yep. Menendez, right? Out of New Jersey. Making Tony Soprano look like uh, 
a clean man. I don't know, clean loving. I don't know. Sometimes my analogies don't work, right? In 2023, we saw the 10-year treasury note, which started the year at 3.88%. It hit 5.02% in mid-October. But it ended at, get this, 3.88%. Where it started is where it ended. Holy mackerel. Uh, the stock market works much better when the 10 years under 4%. When it's at four and a half percent, it's tougher for the stocks to do well. You buy bonds and fixed income when you're getting four and a quarter, four and a half, five percent. If you didn't lock in some of those five percent returns, four and a half percent returns, consider it if they come back in the next coming months. Yeah, the 10 year treasury could move back higher and put stress on the stocks. And if it happens, consider fixed income um, for the long term. Lock in some of that. Those are good numbers. Consult a broker advisor for taking action on anything I ever mentioned on this show. Seven stocks last year accounted for two-thirds of the gain on the market cap weighted S&P 500. So again, if you didn't own the Magnificent Seven, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Alphabet, you had a probably a pretty, t- a pretty mediocre year until October when everything started moving higher. AI was a big story last year. AI is going to be a big story this year. I saw yesterday that Microsoft is designing keyboards so that it has a button on it now that includes Copilot, which is kind of their software integration angle on AI. Um, so you're going to hit the button on a keyboard and it's going to say, what do you want me to do for you? Let me give you an example of ChatGPT. GPT. Um, I was playing with it recently. I got a subscription to it. I'm paying for it, 4.0. And I w- would ask ChatGPT, describe the Battle of Gettysburg in the tone of a valley girl from California. And machine processing took a second and it started printing out text. Like the North and the South didn't like each other and they fought over like a slavery. And they decided they did, and it, it, it was fantastic. You learn better when you learn in different voices. If you just have one professor say, "This is the textbook. This is the way you're going to learn," maybe some people want to learn as if a football coach is yelling at them. Come on, man! Don't you know the North and the South? Um, playing with voices in Chat GPT is going to be big business. Um. Learning how to query chat GPT is going to be a degree. It's going to be part of a college class that you take. What else happened in 2023? We didn't get a recession. Last year at this time, we were talking recession, 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 eh, probably by the end of the year. It's late summer. Then it happened. Job market stayed strong. Inflation came down on core PCE One. all the way to 3.1% year over year in November. If you strip out rents, we're at where the Fed wants to be and rents are falling. So unless something happens with the Middle East or oil, yeah, we should probably be in the Fed's range of like 2%, 2 to 2.5%. This bodes well, not for the immediate term, because no one has a crystal ball, but it bodes well for a patient investor who's got two to three years at least. I want to say five or more. Um, But think about it. Um, That's 2023. Recap one more time to give you perspective, to remember what happened so that you can understand how to approach things going forward. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Find me online at Rob Black Show. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archived podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth Certified Financial Planners online at robblackshow.com. Apple is losing day to day, and it's affecting the stock market because there were $3 trillion roughly. And the SP 500 has assigned value to companies, the bigger they are, the more swing they have in the index. I love it. I own shares of Apple. It's my largest position. I love that they're down. I know you're saying, why? 
Um, I use a financial planner at EP Wealth, and part of that core position, about half of it's been dedicated to option strategies as employed by another financial firm named Spiderock. That relationship that EP has with Spiderock gets me exposure to using my core position to generate income, not just off the dividend. I can still hold the position. Puts and calls are utilized to generate monthly income for me. That's nice. It's six figures. Not monthly, but annually. Um, it's not going to work for everyone. Strategy doesn't always work. If Apple were to suddenly jump to $250, I would lose probably a six, an eighth, a twelfth of my Apple position. But because Apple's a slow mover, we're able to buy back the positions that are put out there. This is not investment advice to you. Options are nearly impossible for the average person. I don't do them myself. I use a company to do them for me. Um, and it's a strategy that generates an income. So the Apple shares weighing down on the markets. If you own a shares of Apple, you're having a bad year so far. For me, I'm looking at Apple for income from options. I'm having a very good year because it's not rising so fast that it's taking out my price targets. Elsewhere today, the rising market rates, 10-year treasury yield is near 4% again. After starting just in a, a crazy run from 3.8 to 5% last year, and then 5% down to 3.8%. Now it's moving back to 4%. I've never seen a yo-yo like that. It's a pretty big yo-yo. Today we're digesting better than expected labor market data. Um, I would say the first Friday of every month, every Thursday of every month, we're going to see unemployment claims. These are This is data that we're going to look at. When we start seeing numbers that look like a recession might be coming, if we move from unemployment levels of 3.6, to 3.8, 3.94, 4.1, if we start moving in those directions, spending is going to be get pulled back. So far, we've seen a little weakening of the labor market. It was described, and I don't know if this is a good description to me yesterday, as a hot air balloon that has kind of like a, a thread-sized leak. So it's coming down slowly. Okay, I get it. I get it. Oh, by the way, Apple was downgraded today to neutral from overweight at Piper Sandler. Okay. Some people would say, I wish you would have told us about that 14 points ago, but we hear you. Uh, today, we're seeing a winner from the Russell 2000 from the S&P mid cap. Again, it's too early in the day to say that's going to be how it closes. Elsewhere today, big stories, um, like I mentioned, Eli Lilly has started doing a website where you can get prescriptions for some of their most popular drugs. I find that to be good for you, Eli Lilly. Good for you. Take advantage of that. Uh, don't rely on a large inheritance. That would be my fortune cookies if I were to make financial fortune cookies. Ancient Chinese secret. Don't rely on large inheritance. People are living longer. Um, I had to ask myself the other day, is Jimmy Carter still alive? Because I know his, his wife is dead. But is he going to turn 100? People are living longer. The average life expectancy in 2021 was 79.1 years for American women and 73.2 years for men. There's a good chance your parents will live much longer than that because of medical advances. Uh, the number of Americans who are 95 and older grew 48% from 2010 to 2020. So we're living longer. And if I die early, my kids are going to get a great inheritance. Well, actually, if I die in my 70s, they're going to get a great inheritance. Because I'll still manage it as if it's growth until I die. If I die like tomorrow in my 50s, they're going to get a good inheritance. Really good. But if I die in my 90s, they're going to get a lot less. Especially if I die with poor health. Right now, a friend of the family, her mother is in, in, with dementia, Alzheimer's. And poor health, and it's a lot of money. It's fifteen thousand dollars a month to keep her housed in California and, and with health care, and with like a nurse, to say the least. Um, think about that. When the average American or the majority of Americans have sixty-five thousand saved for retirement, 
And I just told you a friend of mine is spending $15,000 out of pocket to keep her mother's health care um, maintained. It ain't cheap. It ain't cheap. Um, I found an interesting high quality ETF. And I found it interesting because um, what they're doing is they're looking for high quality companies that have a lot of cash that pay dividends on a regular basis. And I'm not saying buy this. Um, I just found that it was kind of amusing. It's called the iShares MSCI quality factor ETF. And it is kind of what it is. Um, when you take a look at the holdings, it's Visa, Microsoft, Apple, MasterCard, NVIDIA, Meta, Eli Lilly, Broadcom, Nike, and United Health. Um, those are all winning companies. There's nothing wrong with that in any way, shape, or form. When you take a look at the chart of the company, of the ETF, you go, that's pretty good return. Um, on a one-year basis, up 29%. On a three-year basis, up 9%. On a five-year basis, up 16%. On a 10-year basis, up 11.8%. Now, the names are going to change, and there's going to be turnover. Um, you get about a 1% yield, which isn't great. Um, it's not bad either. 1.2% um, yield. And the cost is about 15 basis points. So out of a hundred dollars invested it's 15 cents it's pretty cheap um and again consult work for other actual any stocks ever mentioned on the show um and it's not quite the right calculation but the fees are 15 basis points annually and it's done quarterly so it changes you can figure out that on your own um and that's tier symbol q u a l Big event coming up January 20th. Pints of Portfolio set up at robblackshow.com. Join Rob Black in Sunnyvale, Saturday, January 20th for Pints and Portfolios, a less formal event at a local watering hole for those close to retirement with 500000 or more in investable assets. Drop by January 20th from 11.30 a.m. till 2 for a little sunshine and a complimentary portfolio review or financial snapshot from Ryan Ignacio, CFP from EP Wealth Advisors. Whether you're on the road to retirement or already there, this financial snapshot can provide you with a second opinion analysis of where you are and highlight areas for improvement and opportunities for growth. Go to robblackshow.com and click the events tab. Find pints and portfolios and click to register. You'll answer a few simple questions about your situation and your confirmation email will provide all the details on the event and how to schedule your portfolio review. Space is limited and registration is required. So go to robblackshow.com today. That's robblackshow.com. 